Stand by. Is this thing on? Yes, Dan. Oh, hello. You're listening to Old News with Dan and Carrie. This just in. Breaking news to report. We are live. Old newscasters reunite. Uh, can we just say former? Sure. Former newscasters reunite behind the mic after more than 20 years. Old news is good news. Stay tuned. Welcome to the official first episode of Old News. I am Carrie. And I'm Dan. And old news is everything and anything, right? We can talk about all kinds of topics in all kinds of places. That's the beauty of a podcast like Old News. And we have a great guest for our very first Old News guest today. Lisa Fielding is a WBBM anchor and reporter. She is on the radio every weekday from three to six, and we are super excited to talk to her. I do have to warn you that her audio, she was recording from her phone, and the audio kind of gets a little faint sometimes and then louder. So just know that um, it's not on your end, it's on our end, but you can still hear everything she says, and she is amazing. So let's roll. Three, two, one. Our guest today is anything but old news. Lisa Fielding is an anchor and reporter on WBBM News Radio in Chicago. Lisa's voice fills the airwaves weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 p.m. Dan and I worked with Lisa more than 20 years ago in Madison, Wisconsin. She's had a fascinating career, and we are so grateful to catch up with this award-winning journalist, Lisa Fielding. Welcome to Old News. Oh, when, you, when we first met you, you came to the brand new Fox station. Yeah. Can you go back in the oh. time machine and tell us how that all evolved in your role at Fox mm -hmm. and the relationship of Fox with WKOW at the time? Okay. Well, I was working in Rockford, Illinois at the time. I was the weekend anchor there back 20 plus years. And I was looking for, you know, bigger and better, moving on up the ladder. And I love Madison. I always ha had and have and do still. And was just kind of looking for that perfect opportunity. Didn't find it. I was looking for a new job for like a year, as we all do, mm -hmm. you know, after our first or second steps, we want to go to the next city. And um, how did I even find out about this opening? Maybe, oh my gosh, I have to go back totally in the time machine where we, we were <laughs> sent, we were sending out VHS tapes, right? Right. And I yep. think, I mean, I had, we had to have the internet then, I suppose. I must have, <laughs> I must have like saw an opening maybe on a job line of some sort. And I think I randomly sent my tapes to Todd Pritchard, who was yeah. the news director then and Sandy Kowal, our assistant uh -huh. news director, brought me in for an interview. Obviously, I just loved him and both of them. Mm -hmm. And it was a new concept. I mean, this startup is such a risk, but WSBN at the time, David Ford was the general manager. They really sold me hard. It was a brand new set. I remember seeing the set. I remember sitting down for like a test run with then my co-anchor or potential co-anchor, Jerome Turman. Oh, yeah. Who I think was doing like cut-ins at um, in Milwaukee at TMJ at the time. Hmm. So I remember I was so nervous. They had all the big wigs. I think it was Bob. Who was the general manager at the time for you guys? Bob Miller. Bob Miller, Bob Miller was the general manager, Bob I believe. It was Todd Pritchard, David Ford, who was the um, general manager at Fox at the time. And they were telling us they were starting this brand new early newscast. And then it was like the big trend that Fox national news was trying to get local news. And we were going to bring it at nine o'clock instead of 10 o'clock. And it was, I remember being so nervous because they were all watching us. And I swear to God, I think Bob brought his family or something crazy. <laughs> oh, no pressure whatsoever, yeah. right? But everyone at KW like, was so nice. And I'll, I'll tell you something. I remember walking in the lobby of KOW and all your guys' pictures were like up on the ceiling. Do you remember that? Oh my, the yes, those huge, yes. the huge posters. Yes, and there was like clouds up there. Like it was like <laughs> literal cloud mural or something. And I remember looking up going, oh, <laughs> this is the place. This is super cool. And Don't you I still just, have your big head from the from the <laughs> WKOW lobby? I, I never got one because I was Fox, but you guys oh. had them. You should, there, I remember. Mine was, was floating cool. around as a white elephant gift for a while. Like we'd pass oh, really? it on to the next person, and then they'd like <laughs> take were, it places on vacation. It was a riot. Those were gigantic pictures. Now that I think about it. you guys were like the news gods looking down at me, like telling <laughs> me to come join the family, and I was like, okay. 
so um that's how it started i think and then i remember coming up and like you know doing the fun part and i mean that sarcastically you know negotiating the contract i didn't have an agent or anything so i kind of yeah. went in like i don't know just pay me more than i'm making right now yeah and uh, give me a better schedule and see, see how it goes and so i know that we were really an unprecedented pioneering type of project partnering with wkow right mm -hmm. and right. you know I was the only anchor on the Fox, but then Jerome would also anchor with you guys sometimes. We shared, I think, most of the staff. I think we might have had one reporter, but we got a lot of like national and international press being one of the very first local Fox stations to start mm -hmm. up. And of course, the partnership, like, how is that going to work? You guys are right. competitors. How do you do it? And as you guys can recall, you know, we had a lot of, you know, ups and downs and kind of growing pains, but to my knowledge, I think they're still doing really, really well, like 20, what is it, 23 years later now. Hmm. Yeah. So that was really an amazing kind of scary, risky, but very fun. One of my best memories professionally of being there in Madison, for sure. When you remember, as you know, for those of us who are working on the Channel 27 side, the WKOW side, there's a lot of like, what's going to happen? How is this going to work? How mm -hmm. are they, are they going to steal our stories? Are they going to know what stories we're working <laughs> on? But it just kind of flushed itself out. And I think that's yeah. a credit to you because you were also, weren't you the executive producer for the show too? Yes. yes. I'm a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> I have to have my sticky fingers in it just so I could editorially like fight for, like, I, I kind of went into like how, how you know, cause everybody wants the story first. Mm -hmm. How are we going to do that? How are we going to get our own stories? Like, mm -hmm. but I also was a reporter too. So I was able to do my own pieces too, that only ran on Fox. Ah, just like you guys right. had your pieces that we'd only run on uh, uh, ABC. Right. So we'd have those meetings. Remember we had the meetings at like two o'clock and we had a little fighting over some stories, but I think we divvied up pretty well as far as that goes. But we shared a lot of, you know, just like the, the daily news that we had to report anyways. Mm -hmm. And I think we each had our own kind of enterprising stories too, for sure. Because mm -hmm. we had me as reporter and I think we did have, have a, a Fox reporter who was only solely for Fox. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we kind of shared the rest, I think, as I recall. But yeah, like we shared Mac and we shared Byron. Those were our, those were our media, Byron Morton and Mac was our, was our sports guy. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Mac yeah. Charlton. Yeah. So I was yeah. the only, I think, exclusive Fox, but everybody else we shared, which mm. I think added to your staff as well, I believe to mm -hmm. the ABC side, but I think it worked for many, many years. And then I know that they've since, I think, contracted to another affiliate, right? CBS, I think. Correct. Isn't That's Fox right. with CBS now? Okay. Okay. Yeah. But, and you um, know, it really was a model for kind of the way, in some ways, because of the the financial realities of local TV news, it kind of was yeah. a model for many stations, not even just Fox, moving into the, you know, moving to the future from there. So, I mean, you were right on the cutting edge of that. That's true. Yeah. No, you know, no. you think back. It was, uh, yeah, we got, I mean, we had tons of press for that. Like, hmm. more than I think Jerome and I even just, like, prepared for. I mean, I, I think like, uh, you know, Inside Broadcast came in and took a bunch of pictures of Todd and me and everybody. And I remember I, my first producer was named Hope. I forgot her last name. Um, oh, and yeah. She was, uh, yeah. We were on the cover of like RTND magazine or something. It was hmm. crazy. Yeah. That's wild. KO was doing so well too, though. You know, money wise and stuff like there's all these perks you know, hair and makeup back in the day. <laughs> you know, I'm like, hey, sign me up. This is great, you know. So I had a wonderful time in Madison. And I always tell people, I think I had the most professional freedom and, and satisfaction there. Because really? I was able to do some really, really great, fun, and important stories there. Uh, because Todd and Sandy gave me kind of really the freedom to kind of pick what I wanted to do. And another kind of trend that happened then was, I don't know if they still do it, but we had to really look at our own programming and do stories that tied into programming. Oh, and I, it's some of the stories that I ended up doing. Do you remember that first this reality show called Joe, Joe Millionaire? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I would have never That's come right. up with that, but yeah. Right when Survivor came out on CBS yep. and everyone didn't know what this reality television was. Uh -huh. But then after that, Fox debuted this Joe Millionaire. It was about all these women looking for a millionaire, but the guy was really poor in real life. 
but he played this millionaire. So it was like the whole game, right? So they said, Lisa, how can we tie in like a story? So a friend of mine oh, uh, runs like a high-end matchmaking company. Oh, no way. We did that story and like tied it into Joe Millionaire. So oh. Fox and I think the people at Fox who are running over at Madison really knew the power of like tying in your lead-in story. Mm with something that people will stick around and watch. Like if they're watching Joe Millionaire, hey, coming up, you know, we're gonna we're gonna introduce you to a local Joe Millionaire and a high-end matchmaking and they right. get people to stick around. Huh. There was kind of a big message of the madness with the Fox people, I remember. And and how news, I don't know, you know, we're also kind of old school news people and we tend to, you know, cover this day's news, but right. they really tied into how programming had a big influence on mm -hmm. how many people would stick around and watch your newscast after the program. Mm -hmm. So I remember learning all about that too. Yeah. Well, and as a side note, um, it also inspired many, many Hallmark movies. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know, there were some crazy shows back, I guess it, in 2000 when, when Fox was first debuting all that kind of stuff. We had some crazy lead-ins as I recall. Mm -hmm. What was your first job and why, why did you decide to be a, a journalist? Okay. Okay, good question. Let's see. Um, you know, in high school, I used to love writing. And I remember that in my yearbook, I said I was going to be a newscaster. And at my 20 year high school reunion, I got the award of the person who did exactly what they said they were going to do. Really? And I thought, wow, I just got lucky because, you know, you can say you're going to do something, but it doesn't mean you're going to end up being successful at it. But I remember, you know, we had the news on all the time in our house. My mom just had it in the background all the time. And she'd always encourage me, Lisa, you'd be a great journalist. You like to talk, you like to write, blah, blah, blah. And so I went to Bradley University in Peoria, kind of knowing I wanted to do kind of journalism stuff. Yep. Um, I can't say I learned a ton in college. <laughs> I mean, I did any of us. <laughs> no, I mean, now they have amazing programs, but I had a moment of bravery. I think I was a junior and I literally opened a phone book kids one of those things that you open up and turn pages and they're yellow mm -hmm. <laughs> and i i called like the local NBC station in peoria and i said hey i'm a journalism student do you guys need any interns i mean it was i was super scared to death because i had no idea i did it on my yeah. own huh. like, yeah can you start monday because it was summer and they had no like staff oh, so wow. i got super lucky i mean i had no idea what i was doing i i literally did not meet I didn't really learn much. I don't think in the classroom, it was all street. And I had to, they sent me out reporting. Like I want, if it wasn't the first day, it had to have been the second day. I had oh no idea gosh. what I was doing. Huh. I really was, you know, you learn, you just, you throw it to the wolves and you learn. And so, you know, we were reporting on three quarter tape and, you know, editing and all that stuff. I learned how to edit in school, but that was my first taste was I worked at WEK TV in Chicago or in Peoria. Mm -hmm. yep. And luckily it was a small enough market that, you know, they really utilized their students in hmm. real life, hands-on way. I wasn't getting coffee or doing stuff like that. Yeah. I was really doing what everybody was doing. Mm -hmm. So it was terrible. I had big bangs and really nasally voice. <laughs> I, it's hard. I think I still have those tapes somewhere. But, you know, I really, that's why I am where I am because I had a moment of bravery to open that phone book, I'm telling you. And hmm. so luckily, you know, you know, you either love it or hate it right away, you know. Right, right. Holidays or weekends, you know, it's making minimum wage. Yeah. Um, but luckily I really loved it. And um, you know, wait, you made minimum wage? I didn't even get that much. <laughs> Let's see. I think my minimum wage was three thirty-five, maybe back in the it was. Late it was. I remember yeah. that. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, how did we all survive? Like we think about I how don't know for the longest time. And so, you know, I tell I teach um graduate class in TV and I say, if you're money motivated, leave right now. Mm. because you get paid back in other ways that don't, it's not about money. You know, if you can, if you can afford it and you can, you got to go to smaller markets and do it. But, you know, I would say one out of 20 of my students maybe stick around for more than is five years. Right? Oh, wow. Well, and the teaching is on my long list of things to ask oh. you about because you're teaching at Northwestern. I was for 12 years. I don't do it anymore currently because okay. I'm, I finally got a Monday through Friday job after 35 yeah. years. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Another you sacrifice. finally made it. <laughs> for years, I worked oh, wow. CBM for 12 years on the weekends. Oh, did so, you? Oh, my God. I don't know how I did it. But um, I don't even know what to do with myself on the weekend now. But, um, yeah, so I taught 
school when I had Wednesday, Thursdays off. I, my classes were during the week. But, you know, it's a reality check. You, you got to be a certain kind of person and make certain sacrifices and be passionate about mm -hmm. what we do as journalists. And not everyone really has that or the patience or the, you know, to even go to smaller markets and put your dues in and work the weekends and work the nights and work the holidays. Right. Um, and you know, after the pandemic, it's just not as glamorous anymore. We That's a whole other topic, but we have a, a tough time getting new recruits anymore. Nobody Is that really right? To, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I've heard that from a number of people who still work in the, in both television and in radio and in newspaper. It's tough to get well, people to yeah. be journalists. I know, which it's saddens me. Glamour and attraction anymore to to kids, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. a, it's a shame because it's really an altruistic kind of job, because we're you know we're out there trying to help people and inform people, and we just aren't. It's not about money, so I don't know. Uh, what we're about social media? It. How does how does that social media kind of play into that lack of desire to want to be on TV or on the radio? Um, well, that's a good question because now you've got your citizen journalists, the people, right. anyone can take a phone and be a journalist, you know, but as journalists, we're now expected to be even more multimedia, you know, mm -hmm. like just because I'm on the radio, I'm still doing TV. I'm still using my phone to capture videos. I'm still like doing, Hey, I'm here, blah, blah, blah. You know, tune in, you know, for breaking news. I'm now encouraged to, um, you probably noticed I'm kind of behind the eight ball on like stories and things on Instagram, but I've been encouraged to like promote my show every day on video. And I'm like, I got to oh. keep I don't want to be on TV anymore, but yes. Uh, stories, Instagram, now TikTok, which I thought I was way too old to be on TikTok, <laughs> but apparently now we're all encouraged to do that as well. So yes, um, it oh. kind of saturates what are real journalists and who aren't, but on the other hand, if you are a journalist, you're encouraged to do every kind of social media as well. In addition to being a reporter and covering whatever's going on in the street, I'm expected to post to Twitter and, you know, take pictures and do, you know, um, promotions and things like that hmm. before I even get my story on the air. So that's so, all part of your daily routine is now you've got to post to all these different places. Yeah. And also new journalists have to learn and know all that, which I, most of them do now, because that's part of their right. lives anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, but again, yeah, I mean, I think it goes both ways. It opens up a lot of opportunities, I think, mm -hmm. for young people mm -hmm. on, on one hand, because there's there's all these new forms of news gathering. But on the other hand, um, you really have to be so versatile to mm. do. We always, we always said when we were younger, we were like, we have to learn how to do everything. But there's so many more everything to do right. now. A lot of older people who aren't willing to go into the social media realm. And you got the old schoolers. I'm kind of in the middle where I can kind of do both. Um, but a lot of my, my colleagues, you know, are like, they, they're not doing social media. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It takes a lot of time if you're not used to doing it. Like all the young people are, you know? Sure. I mean, some of these influencers start out, you know, really going out all day and posting all day. Hmm. I mean, think about that. I mean, it's, for me to even do it every other day is kind of exhausting. I was going to yeah. say, it's exhausting to me to just right. think of people doing it all day. Yeah. I know. I met this one influencer on a press trip in Vegas about a month ago. He was probably, I don't know, 25. And I have to admit, I was like, oh, who's this little whippersnapper here? What's he doing? <laughs> and so I said, "How?" he had like 100,000 followers or a million. I said, how do you wow. even... And he gets paid to do what he does. He's like, oh, well, I was living with my parents and I decided to go out and take landscapes of Chicago. I'm like, uh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> um, but he wow. did it he said, but I post like 10 times a day and do it every day. No, it's also circumstance. Like, right. do you have the time? Do you have another job that you, you have to focus on? If not, are you living mm -hmm. with your parents? And the next thing you know, you know, he's making six figures taking huh. landscapes of Chicago. I don't know. It's wow. Really, it's well, it's fascinating to me, but also kind of frustrating. Right. You know, mm -hmm. the, we all took, you know, education and dues and small markets and things like that. But right. there's other way, other path, other pathways now. Yeah. But like you say, you say good for them, but then the other side of you is oh. like, why can't I do that? You know, <laughs> I, I, you I mean, could, uh, but I feel like I, I already have so much to do. And yeah, I feel like I saturate the world too. I'm always like, uh, I have anxiety attacks sometimes in the middle of the night. Like, am I sharing too much? Oh my God. Are people getting sick of me? <laughs> <laughs> never, Lisa, never. 
let me ask you <laughs> let me ask you this lisa because you, you talked about bravery before when you first started your work yeah. and and the joke for a lot of us who used to work in in news and are no longer working in news and we see people like you still doing it we call you survivors hmm. you know you survived all of these years doing news because it's a tough job it, it is, is a really hard job and it's gotten harder how do you keep yeah. yourself healthy how do you keep yourself you know mentally and physically healthy to do a job like you do yeah. physically i would say it's the biggest hardest because as you guys know you did morning show for years mm -hmm. and the morning show is almost the most could be the most unhealthy schedule if you don't know how to just train your body clock, you know, get into a routine where you get off at 10 a.m., 11 a.m. and work out, keep yourself awake so you can go to bed. Like mm -hmm. I remember even filling in a couple times on the mornings and it was so difficult. And then you take the opposite where you work three to 11, you know, the night shift, which yeah. I would say I did the night shift most my entire career. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm a night owl. So, but yet I'm not a morning person. So I couldn't get into the routine of like getting up on a normal hour to like work out or eat normal. I'd come home at 10 o'clock and have dinner or be hungry. Yeah. You know, be wired I'm from your from job. This like slob, slob, you know, where you're just like, <laughs> I don't say slob, like slug, I should say, because you get tired, you work night. So you sleep mm -hmm. till noon or whatever. And you really have to train yourself to get more of a better body clock. And I have to admit, after all these years, finally having like a Monday through Friday, 10 to six. I'm, I think I'm finally getting into like a more a healthy routine where you can hmm. do that. So you're very right. I mean, these are not normal hours, you know, right. and you really have to have some discipline to, as you get older, of course, when you're young, you have a high metabolism and you can pretty much get by on four <laughs> hours of sleep. There's no way, you know, yeah. Had a couple of beers after work, right? Yeah. <laughs> Physically, for sure, the mornings are the toughest. I remember you guys doing that. I mean, I remember I, I could never even do it past a week. I was like, how do they do this for a lifestyle? It really, I give you guys credit for that. But um, psychologically, you know, you can go back and think think about the things that we see as journalists. You know, they're not always pretty. We see people mm -hmm. at their worst. Um, but we try to balance that with good, positive stories, making a difference. Um, and I got to say... The pandemic, I never really had an issue psychologically dealing with the things that I've seen over the years. Um, I had a mental health crisis during COVID and I talk about really? it a lot. In addition to everyone else having their own issues. Yeah. But I never stopped working. I never, I had to go to the office every day. Oh, really? And I, no, I mean, we, I remember thinking, God, should I press the button on the elevator? Is this going to, am I going to get cut? Yeah. I mean, so we didn't know. Yeah. And every day was so stressful because we were these messengers every day was like death and every day we had the the mayor on live she had a live news conference and then we'd have the governor and then we'd have the president president trump going on for two and three hours of craziness sometimes where we didn't know whether to keep it going are these facts are they truth what is our job in this whole situation and then in addition chicago had all this social unrest which was mm. almost worse than the pandemic in itself because George Floyd happened and then people were looting literally around us where we're, we're, we're located on Michigan Avenue. Mm. And we had to, you know, at one point they closed down the bridges and they had like the national guard not letting anyone in one weekend. And we had to have a special letter to get to our workplace. Oh and gosh. I was also fearful for my family, like my parents. And I thought, well, I'm going to work every day. Can I not see my parents? Am I going to, you know, infect them? Are they going to die? Like, I'm not kidding. I went through so many, every morning I woke up like thinking I had COVID. I was like, oh my God, taking my temperature. And, you know, I had an oximeter for my lungs. And I, I guess hmm. as a member of the media, you get exposed to so many different things, like literally and figuratively, that whole time was really tough for me. And right. I thought I was fine. When things kind of opened up again, the fall, I remember, like the restaurant started opening. I was like, oh, I got through it. And I felt like I was overcommitted anyways. And I was kind of glad that everything kind of got canceled. And I was like, just like hanging out and not yeah. doing anything. But then come October, I started getting these panic attacks. Oh. It's not having a heart attack. I was like, what is going on? I mean, I'm fine. What's happening? And so it turns out I was having a little like PTSD where mm -hmm. like you think about the things that bring you joy in your life you know, travel and friends and being able to go out and we weren't able to do any of that stuff. And your serotonin wasn't going to your brain. Mm. And so I was put on like really low, like Prozac, but it mm. helped. It took it away. But I learned more about how your body reacts to stress, fear, um, not 
your life being up and ended and things that bring you joy. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. chemically, I had a, a really like um, post-traumatic, you know, it was months after the height of the pandemic. So you, you go through your, your adrenaline kicks in and you go through what you need to do. But I wasn't feeling the effects until way later. It was so. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, yeah, that was the first time that I had like a psychological reaction to my career. Hmm. You know? Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. I mean, you were in the thick of it every single day. And mm -hmm. there were so many unknowns. Okay, as anchors, we read like a lot of bad news, right? And mm -hmm. people ask us, are you ever affected by what you see and what you read? And I don't know what you guys think, but I remember everything's kind of compartmentalized. We don't. We do our job, we go home, we try not to think about, you know, that horrible house fire that killed six kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, but this one took a toll on me in a totally different way. I guess it because it, it affected all of us. It wasn't just somebody yeah. in a neighborhood we never knew, you know? It, it was, was pervasive, our... you're right, it was everywhere. Yeah. And everyone had their own kind of mental health journey through it. But but it was the first time that I psychologically, I think had a, mm -hmm. a um, you know, an outcome from it. So anyway, how, what is your stress management strategy now? Um, well, you know, getting back to normal mm -hmm. and going to events and seeing friends and I'm a big traveler. I mean, all of that, um, helped me, I think, get my chemicals back to the, where they were supposed to be. And so I was off the medication after about 18 months, oh. but I, you know, I talked to a lot of people and a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I'm on it too. I'm on it too, you know, hmm. but it does, it does, it does balance your, your chemical chemicals. And I learned so much about that. You can think you're okay, but your body knows you're not and right. how you deal with stress, you know, um, now, you know, things are better for me because I'm, I got a more, you know, stable workplace. And after 35 years, I think I've finally figured out a work-life balance, <laughs> you know, congratulations. You, you deserve that after three decades. I know, right? Like I have You're the one. <laughs> so I can even like make plans with people who are actually off the same time I am and yeah. just things like that. Silly like things that I don't think like regular nine to five people work, don't realize how to, um, you know, and there's tons of people who work weekends and holidays and cops and nurses, and there's so many other things saving lives every day. And I certainly was not on the front lines of that kind of thing. Um, but it was a whole different thing that I learned so much about mm -hmm. um, just taking care of yourself more mentally than you ever even thought you had to before. But do you, you identify, know? do you identify with those kind of people? Like, you know, the cops, the nurses, the, the firefighters. I mean, back in the day when I worked in the news business, um, I always felt some type of camaraderie with people who worked as firefighters and police officers, not only because you relied on them oftentimes for, for source material, but they kind of lived a similar lifestyle in many ways. And is it still that way sometimes, or am I stretching here? Oh, I think so too. It depends on, you know, times, what times, what kind of city you're in too, and what kind of relationships you have with right. your first responders as well. Yeah. Madison, you know? Madison's pretty friendly. Oh, <laughs> they were, they were great. I remember doing like media training with them, with cops on how they can mm -hmm. better know that the journalists are your friends and we're here to help you catch the bad guys. Oh. But in many, yeah, many big cities, you know, oh, the media, oh, get them, get them, get out. Right. So it all depends. Um, But I think, I think Dan, you're right. We do. We all work 24 hours. It's not anything that stops. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, they see people at their worst all the time. Yeah. Uh, we certainly can balance that a little bit. But, but psychologically, you know, I believe that more of the cops are setting up mental health programs. I think people are more aware of the kinds of industries that need that help more than others. Mm -hmm. And I think journalists are often forgotten as far as what we need, we, we see bad stuff too, just like cops and nurses and that we're not saving any lives like they are, but we do sometimes arrive at the scene before a cop does or something mm -hmm. and see some bad stuff. And how do you deal with that mentally? And I think more yeah. companies are realizing that too. Well, and you've been targeted in the last, I mean, oh it goodness. seems to me you've, you've become a target of people's, yeah. you know, <laughs> slings and arrows over the last 10 years too. Oh my God, for sure, you know. I was talking about the pandemic, then the social unrest, and then the election. Uh, it was like this, this like triple whammy of really big stressful events that had a big deal on the media. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't tell you how many times I walked down the street and I heard fake news, fake news. And then we see people that have signs that say murder the media. I mean, we, you know, it that started under a certain administration. But um, 
Uh, there are people, I hope that that has eased a little bit, but guess what? We're entering another presidential election involving the same kind of person next year. So I have to admit that took a toll on me as well a little bit, but I laugh it off because we're the most objective news source you can find, you know, in the whole state. So when people yell fake news, I go, you don't even know who you're talking to right now. And, um, I have to admit, social media got really, really nasty. Yeah, as you guys can remember, in twenty twenty, yep. mm -hmm. and had to block a few people. I felt like I couldn't even post a factual article about anything election related. I mean, mm -hmm. I wasn't even taking any type of side. I was posting. I think it was something about Hillary Clinton being the first woman nominated to the presidency, you know, the nominate uh, as a Democratic nominee. And I posted an article about that that I did talking to some local women's leaders. And it was about women's issues. Oh, well, you can imagine hmm. that started a whole S shit storm. Um, yeah. And I, I couldn't, I'm like, I'm a journalist. I did a story about, it's this is about women, pioneering women. And people just went nuts. So, you know, so yeah. we experienced a lot of that where I had to kind of like, block and even defriend some people because they hmm. didn't respect that I was, I thought, being objective and just posting factual stories. And right. people couldn't see the, what are the forest through the trees about what the article was about. It wasn't about Hillary. It was about a woman, you know, shattering the glass ceiling. And so I'm worried that that's going to happen again next year because you're right. The media really got we had a firestorm, not so much locally as as they do mm -hmm. nationally, but people right. don't educate themselves enough before they make threats and say dumb things. So well, it was it's, tough. It's so easy on social media to just be so quick and so reactive. There's no between time anymore. It's just instantaneous. Yeah. Everything's just react, 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 you know, and it hiding behind screens. Social media and election. So we had a triple perfect storm that was really tough. Mm -hmm. um, things come down um, in 2021, um, but, you know, It'll be coming back, I'm sure, next year. So it's all it's all on how we all handle it. We'll we'll see how we'll see how Americans handle this. I hope that they are a little bit better this time around. We're still very divisive, so that's not going to change. Right. But all we can be is objective. That's yes. All. Keep our fingers crossed for you. Yes. On that one. Well, a positive thing that you were putting out into the world was your um, podcast. Was that born out of the pandemic? Yes, it was. Great. So when theaters Great. started coming back to life, that's when yeah. you started it. Yes. Well, I grew up an arts and theater kid, for sure. Um, my family took me, you know, all the time when I was young. And it was kind of our thing as a family to go see shows and things like mm -hmm. that. So it was always something that I loved. And um, there wasn't much, you know, there you know, with TV news and even radio news, the first thing to cut is like an entertainment reporter. It was not something that a lot of industry was willing to put money into. Uh, so I kind of sort of my own kind of niche and kind of mm -hmm. went there every once in a while and pitched stories like, hey, I've got this great idea about arts and culture and theater, blah, blah, blah. And they'd mm -hmm. let me do this and there and in addition to my general assignment reporting. But then I started getting to know some of the actors and the customers and the stage managers. And I realized what an economic engine arts and culture was to every city, but Chicago, especially, we oh, have yeah. a theater district. And it was like every city, but this one, just like New York, dark. For 18 mm. months. Yeah. And you think about the domino effect of that, of all the people that are employed, and it's a huge economic engine to tourism in, in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And they had to fight on Capitol Hill to get, you know, money, government money help. And they just weren't thought of when it came to, you know, um, COVID relief. And so I started talking to this guy named Joe Shanahan. He owns the Metro here in Chicago, one of them. A, like a, a beloved, famous um, venue that, you know, he he gave R.E.M. their first start and The Cure and oh, well. you know, Nirvana and just Smashing Pumpkins, blah, blah, blah. So he said he's just a couple of little bands. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so he's just, he's a famous guy here in Chicago. Actually, he's a famous guy around the world as far as music venues. But he started telling me like, we are not going to survive even when this mm. this pandemic is over. We need to fight and talk to the government and get some kind of money for us. And mm. it took him months to get that COVID relief toward arts and culture and to make, I think, the federal government realize what an impact it has on the economy in general. So when I started talking to all these people, I thought, man, you know, we take arts and culture for granted. 
you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, hey, let's go to a show next week. Or but when you don't have it for 18 months, not only is it the economic part, but it's also psychological. Like people need arts and culture in their lives, you know? And so I kind of started reaching out that way and I called it Backstage Chicago and I started focusing on the people behind the scenes mm-hmm. in addition to the actors and people that we do see. And how many things that are particularly in Chicago, there's probably 250 small and large storefront theaters everywhere. Wow, that's a lot. About 20. Huh. But I can't believe all the little, you know, the Windy City Playhouse and like community yeah. theater and everything that goes on everywhere and how important it really was to so many people. And I, I mean, I had people coming out of the woodwork wanting to be a part of it. Mm. And, you know, I, I learned so much about it. And um, I don't know, I just had a new appreciation to what arts and culture means to all of us as humans. Oh yeah. Let alone, let alone economically. And so it's well, and I, re- how it's born. I remember back when you were, when you were starting that actually, cause I, you know, I, I get posts from you on Facebook and things like that. And I'd see like, oh, she's doing a story on, I think you did one on like the comedy expo. Yeah. Um, that was, and I think they were just kind of getting going again. And there was like an acapella group that you did one on. <laughs> yes, yes. And and I just found those really fascinating. Um, okay. Not only because they were, you know, cool organizations and neat, neat people who were doing them, but also because like you talked about before, it kind of gave us hope again that, hey, things yeah. are getting going again. Yeah. Um, you know, people are starting to perform again and do things. And like yeah. you said, I mean, hell, how many of us uh, binged about a million shows on Netflix <laughs> during the pandemic? Right, that's all we had. And that yeah. just goes to show how hungry we were for yeah. for stuff like that. Very and true. I think, you know, podcasts like yours gave us hope and also, you know, they're fun to listen to. Yeah, and you find out and you think, who knew there was a... LARPing science fiction theater. I mean, right. Right. <laughs> that's how like niche it gets. Yeah. Oh, and so it's all it's a theater designed for science fiction, and they do LARPing and real life action, like you know, um, um, what's the oh Bristol Renaissance, that kind of stuff. You know, yep. those kind of groups. We have a Star Wars club. Who knew? We have a Ghostbusters club in Chicago. <laughs> I mean, these are the funny things that you realize. So many hobbies and things. Yeah. Most storefronts and clubs made it through the pandemic, but there are plenty that did not and had to close down for good. And so that's a whole other you know issue. But they're still having some trouble getting people back. Hmm. You know, Steppenwolf just had to make a bunch of cuts. Oh. Um, so hopefully people will come back. I mean, I uh, my world has gone back like yeah. tenfold, but there are a lot of people who still don't come to the city maybe because they think the crime and, you know, there's a lot of things that people that, that um, prevent people from going downtown and things like that. But um, it's still an amazing experience in any city I feel. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I hope that we've given voice to small groups and things that people might not have known about and said, Oh my God, I love science fiction. I should go see that little, you know, theater on Halstead or whatever, you know? So that's what I had hoped to do. I wanted to get really unusual things. I did a whole, I think, 45 minutes on burlesque. I saw that. I've got to listen to that one as I was scrolling down the topics. Like burlesque. Huge thing in Chicago. Huh. And it's also very, bot- it's about body positivity for women as well. Yeah. Yeah. So burlesque I, is I love- huge up here in Madison too. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we did something on that. So those are the things I kind of look for, you know, unusual things. Cause people mm-hmm. know about the, the Hamiltons and the you know, big stories, but people don't know about the smaller kind of things that are going around, mm-hmm. you know, cabaret. And like you said, acapella, which is amazing too. Um, yep. Just things that people not only need to see, but also participate in all these talented people too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so you're a lover of the arts. You're a supporter of the arts. You're also big into baseball oh. and you've had baseball related jobs. Can you tell us oh, about yeah. your sports oh, background? Okay. Go Cubs. <laughs> yeah. A little team to, called the Cubs. Brewers too. So. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Well, I grew up, I, I tell about a funny story because I grew up in Chicago, Northwest suburbs, but my dad grew up on the South side of Chicago and he was some, something called an Andy Frayne Usher. It was an Usher company that used to, you know, just be the ushers at the old Comiskey park, but they'd also go to the old Chicago stadium and, and they do, they, they give the programs and they, they were the vendors. Right. Oh, so he grew up on the South side and I grew up going to see Sox games. Like 
you know, Pudge and like, uh, you know, uh, Harold Baines and all those guys. Those are all Southsiders in the 80s. So when I went to college, my great grandfather had season tickets to the Cubs, which I unfortunately never got to experience. But I remember always watching the Cubs games with my great grandfather, but was forced to go to the <laughs> South Side with my dad and my brother. So we when I went to college, there was a minor league team called the Peoria Chiefs. And I love minor league baseball. Like that's like, I love that. And so I started going to the Chiefs games and I realized they were affiliated with the Cubs. I'm like, aha. So now I can watch the Cubs without my dad getting mad at me because I'm at college. He won't know I'm, I'm going to these games. <laughs> so I ended up getting, um, going there and being interested in that and um, got to know a lot of the front office and the players of the early, like late eighties, I would say like Mark Grace and like Ty Griffin used to be in the Olympics and Joe Girardi. Um, I could name a bunch of people that were down in the minor leagues and how that works. Like there's these farm system, a, you know, single, a double, a triple, a, and probably one out of 50 might make it to the big show. As you might remember from bull Durham, it was such mm -hmm. a romantic kind of thing where all these kids would come and make $20, meal money just for hopes right. to be in baseball wow. right and so right. i thought god these kids have big dreams just like young journalists you know yeah really most of them don't ever make it you know and so anyway when i moved to rockford illinois there was another minor league team there at the time it was affiliated with the montreal expos the former montreal expos and so i thought god i love i love minor league teams let's go see and they needed a, a public address announcer so I decided to try out for the public address announcer. Well, I was in, I had moved from TV to radio at that time. So I got the job and it huh. turned out to be like this fun, like thing that I did after I, I would work. I don't even know, uh, but I would work, I think during the day, it must've been as a reporter at the radio station or the TV station. And then I'd go and do the games at night. And I think oh I might've made $20 a game or something, but they were the most fun times because you know, we'd have wacky mascot races and like yeah. Max Pacton was there. He was in Bull Durham and Kurt Russell would come and watch his, his, uh, his nephew, Matt Franco, who was like in the, in the, in the single A. And so I got to know that world a lot. And so I fell in love with baseball even more. I used to love it as a kid, but seeing how these kids, you know, would start out in the single A and just work their way up was such a, I don't know, fascinating and rewarding and kind of romantic way of of this game of seeing how it re what it's really like and so obviously i was affiliated with cubs after that it was montreal expos and then it was the rockford royals and then we were a player development contract with the cubs so randy hunley would come out and um all these cubs guys would come visit ryan sandberg and so i was like oh man this is so fun so obviously i would go to cubs games as much as i could at that time right. and right. Even when I lived in Wisconsin, you know, I'd come back for the games and that infamous 2003 Steve Bartman game. Ay, ay, ay. And then <laughs> oh, um, <yeah. laughs> I was in Milwaukee at that time. And, you know, all my Wisconsin friends were like, oh, Steve Bartman, ha, 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 blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So we've had a lot of trials and tribulations as Cup fans. But then when I finally moved to Chicago, I mean, my dream came true when I was able to cover the Cubs um, in the World Series in 2016. It was almost crazy that it took 104 years or whatever, but my whole life too. But people are older yeah. than me that waited longer than that. So uh, I just love, I don't know, just the whole sport of baseball and the mm. whole farm team and the dream. So I don't know, it sounds kind of cheesy, but yeah, um, all. I think it's really cool. I think we were all Cubs fans that year, really, unless you were, uh, uh, you know, a fan of, I can't, who, who did they play in the series? I'm trying to remember. Was it? Uh, oh, Cleveland. Cleveland, Cleveland. I mean, unless yeah. you're a Cleveland fan, I mean, who wasn't pulling for the Cubs? I know. Really? I know. I love that. Yeah. I think yeah. even, so, well, my dad won't admit it. He'll never, he'll, he won't even walk into <laughs> Wrigley Field. He won't walk into Wrigley Field even when they're playing the Sox. He's really? Wow. I mean, we have a good fun like little rivalry every year, yeah. but he won't even, he will not even go step into Wrigley field. So he's wow. a diehard, but Dan, you're right. Most of the world was pulling for the Cubs for sure. Did you ever so try did you ever, did you ever think about being like a public address announcer for like the Cubs or a big league I team? Did. Well, I did actually, I did try out in uh, let's see, what year was it? Wayne Mesmer is the national yeah. anthem singer now, but he used to be the public address announcer and he had a tragedy oh. when he was working for the Chicago wolves. He got shot in the neck. Oh, which was so bizarre for a guy who relies on his oh, oh my totally, gosh he totally recovered but when this happened to him he obviously had to leave his job at the cubs so they put a national mm. search out i did make the finals however 
you really couldn't have a full-time job at the time. Yeah. You had to make that your full-time job. <laughs> Pardon me. I had to sneeze. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if I would have There's nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I had a job, but I was in the finals, but I couldn't. I knew that I, I couldn't do it realistically mm. because he, that I think they hired some really, he was a talented guy, but he like worked at Barnes and Noble or something. So he had a more of a flexible job. I had a full-time yeah. radio job at the time. So I don't know. Yeah. I look back and think, oh, should I have, to, you know, you never know. Um, but I was the first female public address announcer in baseball in 1991. Really? Ever. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, they That's amazing. Now they should have more, more, and more 35 mm -hmm. years later, but they do have like Boston has one. Uh, San Francisco had one and there's a few minor league women. Hmm. Fox sports called me maybe five, six years ago, asking me about this girl who got the job in Beloit. And really? I said, why is this news 25 years ago? Why is it still news? Yeah. It should be mainstream. Huh? You know? Um, right. But yeah, I mean, there's, we're still trying to, shatter that glass ceiling with the public address announcing and women not mm. a lot of women go for it i guess maybe and they should so anyway so i asked you about your first job i'm going to do i'm going to be the first worst and thirst job guy okay oh so okay <laughs> your, oh my God. so your best job okay you know i'm going to just say your best job is the job you have right now okay but okay, okay, okay. <laughs> what, what what was your worst job and what is the job that you might still thirst for Okay. You mean worst job, not in this business ever? No, you just worst your worst job. job. Yeah. Um, when I was 14, I probably wasn't even legal to be working, <laughs> but I was working, I was working in this park district and it was like a park district where corporations would, it was a like a park and it had like rides and all this stuff. And I, I don't know why they made me be the cook. Cause I mean, I had to grill like oh, all this and burgers. <laughs> And I, my mom left because I swear I gave everyone poison, like food poisoning, because like I didn't even know how to cook. I don't know what I was doing. It's but 14. I, was, <laughs> I was 14 and they were having me cook all the burgers for like the Kemper insurance picnic. Oh my gosh. I remember my eyes were burning so hard. <laughs> and like, I swear the guy who ran this park is probably. There was probably 5 million violations with minors working for him and like me <laughs> cooking in front of like an open flame without eye protection. And, I, oh, and we had to clean the oh bathroom. God. Oh, gosh. So, yeah, I hated that job. And then we had to open the concession stand after it was closed all winter and it was just nasty. So, yeah, I just did not like that job. <laughs> no, no. And how about a job you're still thirsting for oh, if there God. is one? Wow. You know, people always ask me, what would you do if you weren't a journalist? I yeah. love photography. You probably can guess that yep. from my posts. I mean, yep. I, I travel, I think, because I love taking pictures and, mm. you know, that kind of thing. So I would love to be, a, you know, I wish I was in on the whole like travel influencer trend before anybody else. Obviously there's 5 billion of them now, but yeah. I think I could have done something with that. <laughs> I didn't even know. And um, I like a travel photographer, I think would be a great job. I think working in sports and baseball still was something I've always wanted to do. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think those did you ever two do a book or anything like that with your photos. Did you ever do a book or I did like actually. Let's see. Did, did I, I read I, about I that. I was right going to ask one. you. <laughs> I know. I was waiting to ask. <laughs> Just so happened to have it. Sitting right next That's to coffee beautiful. Table. Coffee table book. What is awesome. it called? Wait, what is it called? It's drinks. It's called Drinks with a View. <gasps> and Ooh, when I, I like first, space, when Facebook first started coming out, was that 2008 or something? I, when I would travel, I would always. I would order these like fancy drinks and then I would take a picture of them and everyone's like, Oh, what are you alcoholic Lisa? I'm like, no, there's a method to the madness. <laughs> so I, I culminated all these pictures, but I always had to have like, you know, a background of something beautiful. Right. Yeah. So I have from Amsterdam and Greece and like, even, I think there was one in Madison and one in Rockford next to the river or the lake, Lake Monona or whatever, you know? So I try to do that. I did it domestically and internationally and it would say travel photo coffee table book. That's so and cool. so it was just something I wanted to put together and display. I did it through blurb, which is something anyone can do. Yeah. And um, people can buy it if they want to. Um, I had a few people buy it, but that was like, really wasn't why I did it. But I should really do a volume too, because this one's 10 years old already. And I've luckily been to a lot more places since then. But it was uh, travels, my passion. My nephew always jokes because I call myself a sunset chaser because everywhere wow. I go, I'm obsessed with sunsets. So if I travel somewhere, I look up best place to see the sunset. So um, that'd be something else I would do if it, that was an actual job. 
Yeah. Well, just keep publishing those books. Where has your favorite drink and sunset occurred? What a great question. Let me think. Oh my gosh. Well, anywhere in Greece, yeah. I mean, sunsets are, are a ritual. It's like part of the culture. So mm -hmm. every night I would pick a new place where we would see it. And there was, you know, they play Andre Bocelli and it was like this emotional thing. It was like crazy. And so where else, where was I? Where was I, where I saw, I, well, Key West has an amazing sunset as well. I'll be there oh. soon. Yes. I was just there. Oh, I went bragger. There. Well, I went there to, on um, this kind of, I'm a huge Jimmy Buffett fan. Mm -hmm. So when he died, I was like, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but Parrot Heads took it very seriously, like very, you know. So mm -hmm. he started his career there. So we did a little Jimmy Buffett Memorial tribute uh. to, and I got a tattoo there. And that's in Key West of a Parrot. So oh, that's awesome. But if you go, you, you got to go to the sunset. That's there, probably yeah. second to Santorini and Greece. Oh, yeah. Well, I've been to Santorini, and next yeah. week we're actually going to um, Key Largo and Key West oh. because my daughter's yeah. getting married in Key Largo. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. You have a daughter old enough to be married. That's I crazy. Know. I know. Well, that's How about crazy. that, huh? Yeah. I know. Where is she getting in Key West? Anywhere specific? Um, well, like... we're we're going to Key West after the wedding, so we're oh, doing okay. the actual wedding in Key Largo since it's closer oh. to Miami, a little friendlier to the. It's a small destination wedding, but still, the the you know the number of people coming, we were like, we don't want them to drive that far for. Yeah. Uh, Key West is so fun, and it's small enough to just walk everywhere. Yeah. And I, if you've been, I love but yeah. That. Go to sunset uh, to Mallory Square for sunset. So I'm gonna write that down, <laughs> Mallory Square. Yeah. See, we're getting travel advice from you. I too. know. Yeah. See, yeah, we were just talking. My it. wife and I were just talking about going to Greece someday. That's like oh. on our list. We, we want to go to. I've Greece. been there twice, so. and so yeah, me Maybe too. Anything. I, I did I, my I, yoga I, training there. Oh. Cool. I'll zoom you up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd go back in well, a second. The weird part is, I went there. I had two weddings within ten years. It's really so weird. Yeah, wow. I, I'm like, hey, I'm there. So. Oh yeah. yeah. It's so I'll beautiful. go back in a second. Beautiful place. Yes. Absolutely. Well, we should probably let Lisa get back to her life here. Oh no, that's quickly. okay. This has been so fun. I feel like I want to ask you guys questions. <laughs> that can be I, part I, two. I have one more question for you though, unless you have many more, Carrie. I'm sure you have a many, many more <laughs> on your list than I do. But um my question, like who who are your mentors? Who are the people you look up to to, you know, you know kind of I, keep you going? I have to admit, I don't know, you, we're all kind of the same age. I don't know. I, I mean, we all kind of had, I felt like I had to kind of fend for myself. I'm the oldest of my family, mm -hmm. first to go to college. And I just like, I kind of had to wing it to some degree. I, I, I wish I had a me in my life hmm. back then, you know, like right. someone that could say, don't go to the station, look at this contract. This is how you do look for this, make sure they have good, good equipment. Like, I didn't know what to, I mean, I, I obviously I fared fine, but I really kind of, when is his career really blind for sure? I mean, we all loved, I love Diane Sawyer. I love Deborah Norville. I remember watching, you know, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but I really didn't have any um, local mentors growing mm. up, yeah. but I hope to be that to many people now, you know, um, I worked with a woman who was my mentor at WBBM for many years. Her name is Chris Crydell. And she was an institution in Chicago. Everyone knew her as like the woman on the radio. She was so smart, whip smart. She retired probably four or five years ago. But she, I would say she was my local mentor at WBBM hmm. for sure. But going through the trenches like we all did, I, can't, I wish I had someone to kind of guide me into, I don't know, what to look for you know, when you negotiate a contract or yeah. like when you find a city to go to, is it an O and O, an, o and an operated situation? Do you have, you know, paths to growth and things like that? And you learn kind of after the fact of things as a kid, as a young journalist, what you probably should have known or to been look, look out for. So I try to do that for new journalists now. So they make the right decisions and, and get paid enough to make a living and all that stuff. Yeah. You know? Well, and at the level you are now, do you have an agent or how does that work? Do you still do it yourself? I had one from in TV from Mil Madison to Milwaukee. Mm. Um, BBM didn't really talk to agents. Mm. So we're a union now. We're at okay. after all. So yeah. that helps. So I don't need an agent anymore. I mean, I, don't, I, mean, I, I plan on finishing my career here. It's where mm -hmm. my family is. Um, you know, I have no network as aspirations or anything like that. 
I tell my students, don't get an agent until you absolutely have to, because mm -hmm. you can get your own jobs and not pay the 9% and get killed, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, if you need, if you get in the larger markets and you need to negotiate high figures, things like that, then yes, you can do mm -hmm. that. Um, and some stations don't even talk to you without an agent. So mm -hmm. I had a bad experience with, with mine. <laughs> uh -oh. I, he will remain nameless. <laughs> and um, I am very not fans of them. Uh, mm -hmm. unless you absolutely find a good, honest one, who's going to do your best and make you a priority. Cause I was with an agency or someone who had 5 million other, you know, leases. Mm -hmm. So I really, you know, they didn't really care about what I was doing and just took the 9% anyway. And I ended up getting my own job from Madison to Milwaukee. Uh, David Ford, who was the Fox general manager right. went to Milwaukee and he took mm -hmm. me with him. That's why I left. Oh, yeah. what year did you leave KOW? Oh. 2003. Okay. I was there 1999 through 2003 okay. and um, went to Milwaukee from 2003 to 2006. And I got that job on my own through David and my agent took the money anyway. Ooh. Really? So, you live hmm. and learn, right? and yeah. I the, the fine print said, even if you get your own job, you still owe us 9%. Well, I thought to myself, I'm not going to get my own job. I'm, this guy's going to do it for me. Like, why would I get my own job if I have an agent? But mm -hmm. it just so happened that it was more of like a promotion within the company. And mm -hmm. he took the money anyways. So I had to get a lawyer to get him to, to, to cancel that contract. So, you know, young kids just need to know their rights and what they need mm -hmm. and don't need to do right away and young in their career, you know? So, mm -hmm. well, it's good to hear you. It's good to hear you say that you, you, yeah want to guide people down you know, oh, yeah. you know, moving their way down the road because it is hard. You are kind of on your own and it is a very tough business. I'm sure it's gotten even tougher since Carrie and I yeah. were doing yeah. it on a daily basis. So um, it's good to have people like you out there, I think. So thank you for doing that for yeah. people. Yeah, thank that's you. awesome. Tax time. Think about uh, back when we had closing clothing allowances and things like that. Mm -hmm. Those are all things that you could write off back then. You yeah. know, like a magazine subscription, a cable television because I'm doing research as a reporter. Like all those things really would have helped. I think. I think there needs to be like a class for young journalists right. about things, finances, contracts, you know, ethics, just things that I don't think any of us really were told about um, mm -hmm. going in. Uh, you just no, just very to, true. And to keep and to try to stay financially healthy. My God, I mean, I was on credit cards my entire life practically because we mm -hmm. just. Again, we don't get paid a ton of money. We do it for other reasons, but you still got to have a life. And I mean, right. Madison is Madison isn't cheap. I remember my rent was probably a thousand bucks or something, yeah. I think, right back then. People would love to hear that now. <laughs> I know. Well, it was 20 years ago. Well, I came from Rockford, Illinois, which was like dirt cheap, you know, 500 bucks yep. tops. And I, I doubled my rent going to Madison, but I didn't double my salary. Yeah. Just excited and said, hey, I love this. Yeah, road where I worked. I loved, I loved my apartment there. And I was like, I'll work, I'll work out the details later, but you don't know, you don't realize how financially in trouble you can get, you know, by just taking the job and doing what you want to do at the time, mm -hmm. but no one gives you any advisement on how to, I don't know, a, be a reporter making less money than the cost of living to some mm -hmm. degree. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, I think oh, yeah. all journalists get paid nothing at the beginning. Right. Oh, it was tough. Yeah. And right. and, so, they, and there was people who made even less than the on air people who are yeah. working in the news business. So Right, right. It was tough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. You really have to learn the sacrifices and how to really manage all that because mm -hmm. you'll pay for it later on in your life, oh, you yeah. know? So yeah. Anyway. Yep. Yep. Well, now you've made it to like, you've made it to the top being in the uh, top I market. I mean, you must pinch yourself that you're doing this in your hometown. Yeah. I mean, it was weird because I had been in television for 15 years and I, I didn't think of ever going back to radio. Mm -hmm. Um, my students say, Lisa, why'd you go to TV to radio? And I said, well, number one, the opportunity came about BBM was a vault. No one ever left. No one ever left. You know, mm. it's, it's a union job. You never get fired. People are there till they're 80. Um, but there just happened to be an opening and I had a friend in production and said, come in and see, you know, and I, I really got lucky with that opportunity. But I also yeah. carry as a woman to woman, you know, women, unfortunately, have expiration dates in television to some degree. Mm. I mean, men can be on the air till they're 80, but women other than maybe Barbara Walters, they're really. Yeah. So I had to think about what can I do for the rest of my life and not worry about being skinny enough, young enough. You know, it's true. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. wearing the right clothes or whatever. And I got out right before social media, which I'm so glad Hmm. because I have a thin skin. I admit it. I don't, women specifically get a lot of criticism Hmm. on social media who's on who are who's on tv yeah. it's just the truth it's just the truth right. so Carrie and I, no Carrie and i talked about we've talked about that before yeah. where we were kind of lucky we got out of the tv business before social media got crazy me too. Too, because me too. i can't even imagine no. what people have to put up with i know mm-hmm. i know it's so true so as long as my voice hangs in there you know i'm okay so i, I need yeah. to ensure my voice like it's something like yeah so I don't have to worry about it. You now I can roll out of bed and go to work. It's not a big deal. We don't have to worry about hair and makeup as much anymore. Because <laughs> are you ever, do you ever have cameras on you that you're on YouTube or something? Never. Never. You know, it's funny. It's something that my company, I think, wants to do. Mm-hmm. But a lot of a lot of the people in the union have been um, resistant to that. But we're behind the eight ball. Like our sister station, The Score, they have cameras. They're on Twitch. They're on everything. Mm-hmm. And they're they're just dudes doing sports you know, not necessarily TV people. So we should probably evolve into that at some time, but I'm not in any hurry. I don't need cameras on me while I'm talking on the radio. However, I have done Facebook lives and stuff while we're mm-hmm. doing it, but at least we make that choice to do that. Right. So I can kind of control the narrative as far as how many times I put my mug out there, mm-hmm. um, you know, with Facebook lives or promoting something, you know, um, but other than that, we we're not expected to have cameras. In, I was saying court, cameras in the courtroom. No cameras in the newsroom. <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> I'm always, I was, you know, my TV days are over. Well, as somebody who you know, we all kind of went through all these trends when we worked in television and in radio. I'm sure there's trends too that happen. And you know, I remember back in the TV days when Carrie and I back in the old news days. You know, everything had to be live, right? You had to go live, and I'm, I'm sure there's still there's still that element of of wanting to do certain things in television news. But I, I often wonder that even with, um, you know, you talked about the score, and I listen to a lot of sports talk radio, and I see the I see the back, you know, I watch on YouTube and stuff like that, and I think to myself, how long is this going to be a thing? Like, be, yeah. how long am I going to want to sit there and watch? this former sports guy and that former football guy wearing their pajamas talking on the radio. You know? <laughs> Cause at some point it, it just gets to be like, okay, whatever, like put a suit on or whatever, you know, it, it'll yeah. change. It will change at some no, point. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I know. We didn't enter that. We all laugh. Cause we're like, we're all on radio for a reason. <laughs> we don't yeah. need any cameras in here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is a nice benefit. I know. I know. So. Well, I enjoyed listening to you on, odyssey or radio.com odyssey and uh so i was listening to you right here in pittsburgh all afternoon and i was like right away i picked out your i'm like that's lisa that's her yes oh that's so awesome i love that people can listen from around the country and the world now for sure and i think it's a huge i mean again a huge influence i mean when you can put the link and say click here because people just aren't in the car anymore really as much Mm -hmm. and who has radios in their house not many people so you're going to stream it and yeah. so i think that that's the future for sure uh we yep. still obviously are on the radio band for now right um but i i love that i can just put that out there for whoever wants to listen or if anybody wants to click my story so that obviously that's a huge difference for us in the last i would say five years is to have that capability and you know expand our reach around the world so so that's been good and i i'm glad that you know you guys can hear us as well i mean mm-hmm. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Good, good. Well, hey, Lisa, thanks a lot for taking a lot of time yes. to talk with oh us. Oh, my God. Today. Thank you so much. After a full day of work, and then you come and sit down and talk more news with us. So. <laughs> awesome. It was great. You know, I had a really good experience in Madison. Like I always say, professionally, I had the most freedom. I had the most fun. You guys were the most welcoming crew, I swear, yeah. under the weirdest circumstances, too, you know? And so I really had a great experience there and I loved living in Madison when you guys awesome. were there. So haven't so been good lately. to see you. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute joy. I can't wait. To Thanks a ton, Lisa. We'll see you again soon. Okay. Maybe we'll see you at a Cubs game. Yeah. Oh, sure. You better call me if you come to Chicago. <laughs> Will do. Okay. Will do. It's a deal. Promise. Thanks for tuning in to Old News with Dan and Carrie. That's old news for now. Join us next time.